Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, okay, so before I start, uh, were there any questions about the um, uh, assignments or uh, syllabus or anything like that. Okay. So, um, so the reading for today was from the preface to the B edition. Um, this, this book has both a preface and an introduction, so the reading for next time will be from the introduction. Um, and basically the division of labor between the two is that the introduction says what the book will be about. Um, whereas the preface says, is about like, why you would write a book about that. This is actually kind of a common way of dividing between in preface and introduction, I guess. Um, um, but it's a little bit confusing um, because it means he's telling you why he's writing a book about this before he tells you what the book is about. <laughs> um, so I'm going to try to fill in, you know, a little bit about uh, what the book is actually going to be about in order to make sense of what the preface says the purpose of the book is. So, um, but first, just like briefly, what is the purpose? So that the answer is complicated, right? It's, he says a lot of things about it, but I think the most, to summarize the most important point um, the book is supposed to undermine certain metaphysical positions. Um, and these are metaphysical positions that uh, would seem to make morality impossible. So this book is part of Kant's theoretical philosophy. It's about epistemology and metaphysics. It's not his practical philosophy, his ethics and politics, but he's saying in the preface that the most important purpose for the book is um, to undermine, as I said, metaphysical positions that would seem to make it impossible to even talk about ethics. Um, and by undermine, I mean not that he's gonna show that they're false, but um, very roughly speaking, he's going to show that we don't so much as understand them, that we're incapable of meaning what those metaphysical positions are supposed to maintain. Right, so the, the easiest uh, one to understand and the one he talks about the most in the preface is the possibility of free will, right? And the, uh, according to Kant, morality presupposes that there is free will in a very strong sense. Um, and uh, a certain kind of metaphysical arguments uh, appears to show that there, there could be no such thing. So if that were right, morality would be impossible. Um, but rather than showing that we do have free will, in other words, that, that that conclusion of that argument is false, Kant is going to claim that what the argument is about is something that, like, either conclusion is something that for theoretical purposes we aren't capable of so much as understanding or meaning. Um, so therefore, the most important implications of the book, uh, as Kant himself describes them, are going to be negative. 
um, right? The, the, the most important outcome is going to be that we can't have a kind of uh, knowledge. We can't know anything about a certain topic, which it seemed like we could make, we could know something about, and we were arguing back and forth about it. Um, Okay, so that's gonna that's gonna be at least as I keep saying the most important among the overall answers to that question of the preface. Now, as I said though, to um, to get farther with explaining that how it works, I have to say some things that are kind of a preview of what he's really going to start talking about in the introduction. Um, so. You know, I don't, I hope this is going to work out okay. This isn't the room I usually need to do this in. I'm going to see some weird stuff as I move around. All right. Um, so basically, the main question within the book itself is going to be about the possibility of what Kant calls synthetic a priori knowledge. So what synthetic means, I'm not going to try to, to get into today. Uh, it will turn out that like a big part of the introduction is Kant's explanation of what synthetic means. But a priori, um, so roughly speaking, synthetic means that it's like substantial, that it's not just verbal knowledge or something like that. Um, but the a priori part is the one that I want to talk about now. So a priori, so in Latin, a priori means from before, right? So um, and the way Kant is using it in this context is to mean um, before experience, right? So a priori means before experience. Um, that is, the question is going to be how we can know something about something before we experience it in advance of experiencing it. Um, but I have to say, I have to add immediately to that, and this is very important to always keep in mind, but the way Kant talks, it's not always easy to keep it in mind. But so, namely, that this before experience is not literal, right? There wasn't actually a time before we had any experience when we knew something. And then we started to have experience. There wasn't even an instance before we had any experience when we already knew something. Um, that So, it doesn't mean literally before experience. Rather, what it means, roughly speaking, is that it's knowledge we haven't learned from experience. Right? So it's before our experience of the object in the sense that we don't have to wait for any experience of, of the thing to already know this. That is, we haven't learned it by experiencing the thing that it's about. Um, are there questions about that so far? Okay, so like I said, um, the, the overall purpose of the book is basically to answer that question. Um, I mean, uh, 
Well, he'll explain more about how he's going to do that in the introduction, but that's the that's basically the over like this. That's the overall plan of the book is to answer that question, right? I mean, the purpose of the book, as I was saying, is that somehow the way he's going to answer this question is going to undermine these metaphysical positions that he thinks are dangerous. Um, but the the way he answers the question is is. So it's going to have those negative implications, but it's also going to have positive implications. That is his answer. Like if you ask, can we have synthetic a priori knowledge? And if so, how? The answer is going to be, yes, we can. And he can explain how. Um, but there's also going to be a negative part of the answer that's going to be, since that's the explanation for how we can have synthetic a priori knowledge, we'll be able to see why it's limited, right? We could, we can have certain kinds and there's other kinds we can't have. Um, so those are kind of the positive conclusion of the book and the negative conclusion. So what are the two, what are the two kinds? So like the positive conclusion Wait, is that visible? No, it's not. These are the kinds that we can have. And this is the negative conclusion. The kinds that we can't have. So on this side goes, first of all, mathematics. Um. Now, um, right, so that is in the realm of mathematics, Kant says there is knowledge that we haven't learned from experience. So for mathematics in Kant's time and, and up until Kant's time, uh, uh, means basically arithmetic and geometry. Um, so uh, like, here's an example from mathematics that Kant says is synthetic a priori knowledge. Five plus seven equals 12. So why would you think that we haven't learned that from experience? Well, um, um, basically because you can use it to check experience, right? Like, so if I have a bag and, you know, I put five apples in and then uh, you put seven apples in. And now I want to know, were there any apples in there to begin with? You know, uh, in other words, were all the apples that, that you and I put in, were those all the apples in the bag? I can check by emptying out the bag and seeing if there are 12. If there are more than 12, we know another apple somehow got in. If there are less than 12, the bag must have a hole or something, right? So in other words, like, uh, um, uh, the conclusion can't be, oh, in that case, five, five plus seven equals 13. On the, on the contrary, because you know that five plus seven equals 12, you, that's part of how you can learn from experience how many how many apples were in the bag, right? That is, so you you use it to check experience, and so you couldn't have learned it from experience. 
Now, I mean, that argument I'm giving is not, um, I mean, it's related to a kind of argument that Kant is going to give, but uh, but it's it's not Kant's argument to show that this knowledge is synthetic a priori or how it's possible. It's I'm just I'm just trying to motivate like why would you think right away that that's probably an example? Another a geometrical example would be well I'm not going to write this but a geometrical example would be that. Um, between any two points, there's a single straight line that also is the shortest path between those two points. Um, right, that's a piece of geometrical knowledge. And again, if you think about it, and this is close to an argument that Kant's actually going to make. Um, how do I experience a bunch of different things, right? So in order to learn from experience, I have to basically like examine things one after another and see what they're like. So I examine this one and then I examine this one. So how do I know that I haven't got the same one back again? Well, basically it's because the two things can't be, I mean, sorry, one thing can't be in two different directions at the same time. So again, it seems like, right, that is because if uh, the, the single straight path from me to the object is this way, it can't, therefore there can't be a straight path from me to the object in this direction. So when I look in this direction and I see something, it must be something else. So you need to already know that to learn from experience. So you couldn't have learned it from experience. This is what you might think. Uh, you know, of course, not everyone agrees with this, right? Like uh, John Stuart Mill, who I was talking about a little bit last time, would say even about five plus seven equals 12, that uh, uh, that's, uh, it seems to us unimaginable that that could go wrong, but it's only because we've had so much experience of the laws of arithmetic working the way they do, that we're now unable to imagine them failing. But in fact, we just learned those from experience like everything else. Um, but, uh, but I mean, uh, um, that's not an easy position to take. Right? It is very difficult to imagine that five plus seven might not equal 12. <laughs> um, so, uh, so there's some possibility to, to these examples. Um, Hunt actually treats them as uncontroversial. I think, I mean, um, he knows that Locke agrees with him about these examples, and he at least thinks that Hume agrees with him about them. Um, so, um, so although that's one type of synthetic a priori knowledge, Kant thinks that it's a kind that people don't, um, that everyone pretty much agrees that we have. Um, and also, it's going to turn out to be pretty easy for him to explain why we can have it. So only a little bit about, of the book is going to be about that. But then the second example is metaphysics. And metaphysics, unlike mathematics, is spread over these two columns. That is part of metaphysics, a certain kind of metaphysical synthetic a priori knowledge, Kant is going to say that we can have, and he's going to explain how we can have it. 
and a certain kind is going to be the bad kind of synthetic a priori knowledge that he wants to prove we can't have. So an example that would go under here is I hope this is legible. Every event has a cause. Um, Right, so every event has a cause is not a principle of arithmetic or geometry. Um, I'm not going to try to define metaphysics now. Kant actually is going to give a definition of metaphysics at some point, but uh, but uh, this uh, pretty clearly, I think, belongs to the realm of knowledge that people usually call metaphysics. Um, every, and uh, it's a principle that, well, why would you think you couldn't learn this from experience? So if you've already taken 100C, um, if you're taking 100C now, this is a spoiler. <laughs> if you've already taken 100C, um, you'll probably remember that Hume has a whole complicated argument to show why we couldn't possibly have learned this principle from experience. And, uh, you know, although the argument is complicated, I can boil it down to this, that um, what does it mean to learn from experience? Well, you know, it means that um, the things we want to know about have effects on us, right? They're ca they cause our sensations. And based on those effects, we try to infer something about the cause, right? So we're trying to learn something about the things that um, have caused our sensations based on what our sensations are like. But in order to do that, you have to know that those sensations, since they were events in us, must have a cause. So if you don't already know that, it's too late to try to learn it from experience. So, um, So this is the more, this is the part that Kant thinks is controversial because this he knows that Hume disagrees with him about, um, right? That is uh, Hume after proving that we couldn't have learned this from experience concludes that therefore we don't really know it at all. Um, he says, nevertheless, we're forced to believe it. Right. I mean, no, he thinks that no argument he can make will ever convince you to stop doing that, to stop inferring from an event that you see that something must have caused it. Um, but he says that that's not uh, justified by reason. It's just a principle of our imagination. Um, so, uh, um, and whereas Hume, I think, is thinks that outcome is okay, maybe even good in a way, um, reminds you that you can only use reason to so far, that if you try to use it for everything, you'll end up with an absolute skepticism. So um, so Hume thinks that result is not bad, but but Kant thinks that that's a terrible scandal to philosophy, that we, that, that we can't show that. And so, um, fortunately, <laughs> uh, 
he finds that he is able to show it. And so this principle that every event has a cause is what he proves in the second analogy, and we'll, we'll get to that later. Um, so the positive part of the book is about proving things like metaphysical things like that. Sorry. Um, so that positive part of the book is directed against the empiricists. Right, it's it's it aims at showing that we can have a certain kind of knowledge that empiricists think that we can't. Um, at least against the a radical empiricist like him. Um. So uh, on the other hand, the negative part, which as I already said, is from Kant's own point of view, more important, um, is directed against the rationalists. So in the process of showing how this kind of metaphysical knowledge is possible, I haven't said what kind it is yet. <laughs> Like what's the difference between the two kinds? But in the process of showing how that kind is possible, um, Kant shows that another kind of metaphysical knowledge is not possible. Um, and um, that, that kind of synthetic a priori metaphysical knowledge constitutes like the most important parts of the rationalist metaphysical systems. So, um, um, so although Kant thinks that you know both the empiricists and the rationalists are wrong, um, the his. The empiricists, he's, um, first of all, like his disagreement, his disagreement with Locke is more subtle than even than his disagreement with Hume. Um, it's, uh, Locke in effect does think we have synthetic a priori knowledge, but he tries to explain it by a kind of um, perception there's perceived necessary connections between different ideas. Um, but I, um, so with Locke, he, Kant is gonna disagree about whether that's a possible explanation. With Hume, the, the, the disagreement is whether we have this kind of knowledge or not. But that disagreement is, even in that case, is limited because as I said, Hume doesn't deny that we believe this. And he includes himself in that, right? So Hume himself believes that every event has a cause. He just thinks we're not justified in believing it. <laughs> so, he, you know, we, we have to believe in it. As he says at some point, nature has not left it up to so, so unreliable a faculty as reason to uh, make sure that we believe certain important things, like that every event has a cause. We just have to believe it, even though we don't have an argument for it. So the, so, so, with, so with Hume, the disagree, you know, Kant is, what Kant is doing is adding a justification to something that Hume believes anyway. But on the rationalist side, um, and here talking especially about Leibniz, Spinoza, Leibniz, and Christian Wolff. Um, who was a follower of Leibniz 
Um, and um, did I mention it in the last lecture? I don't remember. But Christian Wolf was a follower of Leibniz. Uh, unlike Leibniz, he wrote these huge systematic treatises about metaphysics. For sure, but I do hope we're gonna be back in person next week and a little bit, work a little bit better. Apologize for this. He was a follower of Leibniz. He wrote, uh, yeah, um, he wrote long systematic treatises, both in Latin and in German. And he uh, founded a school, Leibniz sometimes refers to it, I mean, Kant sometimes refers to it as the Leibnizio, Leibnizio Wolfian school um, that uh, came to pretty much uh, control the universities in Germany. So Kant himself was educated in this school and used textbooks written by Wolfians when he lectured and so forth. So, um, so against those people, Spinoza, Leibniz, Wolf, and followers of Wolf, um, Kant has like a much stronger kind of disagreement because he's going to take what, as I said, is the like are the central pieces of their system and um, and say that again, not that they're false but basically worse than that. But we don't know what we're talking about when we ask questions about them. Um, in other words, as you know, as compared to the rationalists, Kant, that, that part of Kant's system is skeptical and it's not like moderate skepticism of the kind that Hume proposes, right? That is because, again, Hume says, well, you know, I have these skeptical arguments about everything against everything, but you're not really going to believe the conclusion. But Kant is going to say, we have a tendency to think that we can have knowledge about these matters but uh, we should resist it. And by, by showing the basis of the illusion, he's gonna, uh, he hopes he can help us resist it. Okay, um, are there questions about that so far? In some way, all this stuff is pretty straightforward, but I know from experience that people sometimes find it confusing. Um, you know, like I get responses on exams where people think that Kant said synthetic a priori, a priori knowledge is impossible. And as you can see from this picture, that's not right. He thinks a lot of types of synthetic a priori knowledge are possible and he explains how they're possible and what and why we actually have that kind of knowledge. It's but it's a special kind of it that he shows is not possible. Okay, so what is the what what is the bad kind of metaphysics and how is it different from the good kind? So basically, um, the kind that Kant is going to say we can have, like every event has a cause, is knowledge that we haven't learned from experience. So it's, so to speak, before all experience, but it's about the objects of experience. That is, it's about the things we experience. Whereas this kind of metaphysics
which Kant calls transcendent, is supposed to be knowledge about things that are not possible objects of experience at all. So for the, like, what's an example of something that's not a possible ex object of experience at all? Well, easy example, God. Another example would be an immaterial soul. And a third example, which is in some ways the most important, but hard to understand, is the world as a whole. Right? Because, of course, we experience the world. The world basically, uh, as Kant understands it, means everything we experience. We experience the world, but we never experience it as a totality. We always only experience parts of it. We experience more and more of it, but we never experience it as one whole finished thing. So when you when you take any of these three objects, and I think Kant thinks uh, these aren't the only possible examples, but these are maybe the only motivated examples, the only ones that we actually find ourselves wanting to know about. So when you take any of these three objects, you're talking about something that could never you could never experience. Um, because they're too big, because they don't change, because they don't affect our senses. Um, um, I mean, uh, when we get uh, more into Kant's actual discussion of this, we'll see, you know, exactly why I think these things could never be objects of experience. But it's, uh, but I mean, um, um, it's clear enough that they're they're, they're not sensible things, right? They're not things we know through. Experience means sense experience, roughly speaking. It means if if you're also in 100C, it, it's, it means the same thing that Locke means by experience in this week's reading from 100C, sensation and reflection, right? External sense and internal sense. Um, so uh, none of these things... Uh, you might ask, what, what about the immaterial soul? But uh, um, um, I think Kant is right to say that people don't conceive of that as something we immediately experience in the internal sense. Um, so, um, well, if that's something we don't experience in the internal sense at all, I guess I should say. Right. So, so, um, so if you had any knowledge about one of those objects, it would have to be a priori, right? Just by definition, a priori knowledge is knowledge that we haven't learned from experience. Here we have objects that we could never experience. So. If we don't have any knowledge of them that we learned from experience of them, because we don't have any experience of them and we can't. So if we have knowledge of them, it must be knowledge we didn't learn from experience. That is, it must be a priori knowledge. So the supposed science or discipline of transcendent metaphysics would consist entirely of synthetic a priori knowledge. And that's the part that Kant is going to show that is impossible, right? As opposed to every event has a cause. So an event um, is a possible object of experience. 
something that changes in time and that change can have an effect on me so I can sense it. Um, so like events in general are possible objects of experience and what I'm knowing about them here, although I haven't learned it from the experience of them, is all its applications are in experience. Right? That is, every time I apply this rule, it's going to be to something that I've experienced. I experienced the event. And then I use this principle to conclude that it has a cause. So that's the good kind of metaphysics, imminent metaphysics, although he doesn't use that term as much, but that is the opposite of transcendent, imminent. Right. So like imminent metaphysics is um, metaphysics, metaphysical knowledge about the objects of experience. So in the positive part of the book, Kant is going to show that and how and even in a fundamental way, what that um, things we can know about that imminent metaphysics, right? He's going to actually prove a set of principles, which he says are all the fundamental principles of, of that part of metaphysics. And as I said, one of them is every event has a cause. And, that, and then the negative part of the book is going to be um, Um, explaining why the arguments that make it seem like we can have the other kind are all bad arguments and are based on an illusion. Okay, I'll pause again to see if there are any questions. No one has said anything today. I'm not even really sure I'm talking to anyone. <laughs> I'm in the matrix. Um, all right. Um, if you have a question, you can ask in the chat or you can just speak up or whatever. Um, okay, so going back to the preface, so like in more detail, the, 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 the way Kant addresses the issue in the preface to the B edition is basically like a defense against the claim that this work is purely skeptical, right? That its whole business is just to destroy knowledge. And uh, Um, and what's the good of that? Um, so, um, so Kant wants to distinguish between what he's doing and skepticism. Put it that way. He does put it that way, so I'm going to. So normally, the opposite of skepticism is. Oops, that's too high. 
Dogmatism. Right, where dogmatism um right, so dogma means belief. So like dogmatists is what the ancient skeptics called all the other philosophers, namely the philosophers who said you should believe something. Whereas the skeptics said you should suspend judgment about everything. Um, so uh, those, you know, that looks like being the two alternatives. Um, but um, Kant distinguishes his method, which he calls critique. from both skepticism and dogmatism. So how is that possible? How, how can you uh, be neither a dogmatist nor a skeptic? So um, I think uh, so I think the answer is first of all to realize that uh, skepticism itself obviously is not supposed to be a belief, right? That is, a skeptic shouldn't better not be someone who believes that you should doubt everything because then they would be a dogmatist. <laughs> so what skepticism really is, is a kind of procedure. And it's a, a skeptical procedure. Which is that um, you start with whatever someone is certain of, and from that you prove a contradiction. Right, that is showing that the, the things they thought were certain are not consistent with each other. So often this consists in like producing arguments for both sides of a question, um, both of which it seems like you have to accept. And yet they, they can't both be right. And therefore uh, you're not sure what to say anymore. That's the skeptical procedure. So the dogmatic procedure, and so Kant doesn't, I don't think he actually says skeptical procedure in the preface, but it's implied by contrast with what he does talk about, which is the dogmatic procedure. And the dogmatic procedure, you know, um, starts with uncertainty. And it produces a proof from first principles. which results in certainty. So Kant says, 
This is on B Roman numeral 35, and it's page 32 in the translation. Now, let me see if this works. What is that really? This critique is not opposed to the dogmatic, dogmatic procedure of reason in its pure knowledge as science, for that must always be dogmatic. That is, yield strict proof from sure principles a priori. It is opposed only to dogmatism. Right? So what Kant is saying is that um, uh, just using this dogmatic procedure and therefore not being a skeptic doesn't itself constitute what he's calling dogmatism. Rather, what Kant calls dogmatism is to start off that dogmatic procedure without first looking into our right to do it. So the dogmatic procedure is okay if it's preceded by an investigation of what gives us our right to uh, carry out this proof in this case. Now you might say, well, hold on a second. How could we possibly question our right to do this? So, I mean, this is a proof from first principles. So you know that, I mean, we know in advance that if you let the skeptic demand that we provide a proof of first principles, then the skeptic is already one. Right? Like, as soon as we concede that first principles require justification, then there's no need for the skeptical procedure. It's like, we're clearly in a position where we, we've accepted a, a, a demand that we could never fulfill because it's an infinite regress, right? So like if they ask for a justification of first principles, then and we, we acknowledge that that's legitimate, then we would have to produce more fundamental principles from which we could prove those which turn out not to be first principles after all. And then that can be repeated over and over and we'll never finish our justification. So, um, so we, we can't recognize that demand and the skeptics know that, right? The skept that's, why that, that's why the skeptical procedure doesn't work that way, right? It doesn't work by just asking everything you say, just asking, oh, how do you know that? Oh, how do you know that? Right? Because they know that, of course, the dogmatists are going to stop at some point and say, well, we just know this. It's self-evident. It's the first principle, whatever. Right. So instead, that's why instead the skeptical procedure goes in the other direction and takes the things that you, uh, you know, you claim that, you know, and reduces them to a contradiction. So, but... Um, so turning that back around against Kant, we, again, we can say, what do you mean before we start the dogmatic procedure, we should justify our right to do that? Doesn't that just mean requiring a proof of first principles? Which everyone, even skeptics in effect, understands is not legitimate. So the answer, which is super important, um, is, and is 
basically like one of the keys to the way the whole book works is that what Kant is going to question is not our right to the principles, but our right to the concepts in terms of which the principles are stated. Right, so going back to that passage I was reading before, um, This critique is not opposed to the dogmatic procedure of reason and pure knowledge, blah, blah, blah. It is opposed only to dogmatism, that is, to the presumption that it is possible to make progress with pure knowledge according to principles from concepts alone, those that are philosophical, as reason has long been in the habit of doing, and it is possible to do this without having first investigated in what way and by what right reason has come into possession of these concepts. That's what the question's going to be about. Um, and um, by asking that question in the right way, Kant thinks he can show that, first of all, that we do have the right to certain concepts in terms of which some principles are stated. Um, like cause, which in effect Hume's attack on our knowledge of cause and effect uh, um, really tends to show that we don't know what a cause is. We don't have such a concept really. I mean, there's different ways of putting it. We don't have such a concept or that the concept that we have that we think of as a concept of cause is really just a, a concept of a kind of habit we have of, of thinking of one thing after another. Um, uh, and therefore it doesn't involve the kind of necessity that, the, that a true concept of cause would have to bring with it. Um, so in any case, however you, you, you look at what Hume is saying, Kant what is going to try to show that we do have a right to that concept. Now, I mean, to say we have a right to it is kind of a metaphor. I haven't really filled in exactly what that, what the question is when you ask whether you have a right to a certain concept. We, we'll go into detail on that um, soon, but um, um, but Kant is kind of show that we do have a right to certain concepts. The argument that is supposed to show that is the hardest part of the book. It's called the transcendental deduction of the, the transcendental conduct, deduction of the pure concepts of the understanding. Um, and Moreover, the way he's going to show that is going to be such that it automatically results in also listing all the principles that we have to know are true. Um, but um, um, is it a proof of the principles? Well, I mean, he calls it, he calls what he does a proof of he proves each of the principles, but he ultimately he proves it from the fact that we must be able to employ these concepts, which we've already shown we have a right to, not from some uh, earlier principles about the object. Um, Okay, so um, so when Kant is, again, getting back to the question of the preface, when Kant is confronted with this question, like, okay, so um, is there anything to this book except just 
negativity, right? Destroying knowledge. Um, you might expect him to reply um, by pointing out the positive outcome of the book. Right, saying, well, but I haven't just destroyed knowledge. I've also proved that every event has a cause and whatever. Um, he doesn't say that at that when at that point. And I think the reason he doesn't say it at that point is that um, um, once again, the positive part only justifies stuff we would have believed anyway. Even without Kant's argument, we would have believed that we have a right to the concept cause, or at least we would have used it as if we had a right to it. And we would have believed that every event has a cause. And even Hume agrees with that. Um, so the positive part might seem not worth the effort. Now, I think, you know, when we get to, well, maybe I shouldn't say that. I'll just say, like, it's, of course, not really that simple. I mean, as part of the positive part of the book, uh, Kant develops the basis for uh, Newtonian physics, essentially. Um, and there's a part that we're going to get to called the amphiboly, which, among other things, constitutes an argument against Leibniz in, in defense of Newton. <laughs> um, and it's not true necessarily that everyone, even in Kant's time, at least on the continent, um, already believed that Newtonian physics was correct. But there was nothing controversial in what Kant was trying to show. But, um, um, I guess you can say Kant probably felt and probably felt correctly that nevertheless, Newton didn't really need his help, right? That, you know, uh, whatever the delays were in accepting Newtonian physics, that, you know, uh, um, um, it was pretty sure that everyone was eventually going to accept it. And if they didn't, uh, no argument that Kant made was going to help. Right, so he doesn't actually justify it that way. Now, that is, he doesn't actually respond to that criticism that way. Now, like another way you could respond to the criticism is to say, well, okay, who says it's not useful to, to prove something negative? Um, especially something negative like this. So remember, the, the, the negative outcome is going to be. Um, to warn against a false temptation to think we know things when we don't. Um, and note that in the preface, Kant alludes explicitly to, to Socrates. Right? I mean, uh, that is, if you think Socrates' project was useful, then you should think Kant's project is useful. Um, and like, in fact, early on in the preface, he gives a pretty strong reason for thinking that this particular way of correcting, right, that, that the bad thing, the really bad thing is when people think they have knowledge, but they don't. That's what has to be corrected. And he gives a, a pretty good reason for thinking that, that in this particular case, um, there's a definite benefit to that um, because he says that's the only way we can get out of this situation of constant warfare between different schools 
which there seems to be no hope of ever resolve, uh, resolving. Um, so, uh, so what's going to be avoided here is not just kind of wasting our time thinking about something when really we'll never know anything about it, but actually like uh, Kant hopes that what's going to be achieved by this is the end of an irresolvable conflict, which um, moreover, as he hints at various points, tends eventually to spread outside the schools and involve society as a whole. Right, like so. For example, the quest questions about free will were among the questions that Protestants and, well, different kinds of Protestants and Catholics were uh, disputing between each other. So they were involved in large-scale societal conflicts, which, if Kant is right, could you know would never be resolvable um, because none of the sides really know what they're talking about. So um, that like negative uh, outcome actually is useful according to Kant, and he does he does say that. Um, this is. Uh, B Roman numeral twenty four. Um, yeah, so this is where that objection actually gets stated. He starts answering it, but it will be asked. What sort of a treasure is this that we propose to bequeath to posterity? What is the value of the metaphysics that is alleged to be thus purified by criticism and established once for all? On a cursory view of the present work, it may seem that its results are merely negative, warning us that we must never venture with speculative reason. So speculative is the Latin equivalent of theoretical. Speculative reason means theoretical reason. Warning us, we must never uh, venture with speculative reason beyond the limits of experience. Such, in fact, is its primary use. Right, so yeah, actually that is useful. So Kant does give that answer that um, just saying that, that the main outcome of my book is negative is not really an objection. But he also does want to claim that there's a positive outcome of the negative project. So I guess, I mean, I relate, I erased the two columns that said positive and negative. I can't draw something on it unless I, well, unless I draw them again. Why not? Right, so there, there are two main outcomes of the project. One outcome is positive. It proves that imminent metaphysics, well, and mathematics are possible. So this is clearly a positive result, but it's kind of trivial. Um, at least, again, in the sense that we would have believed it anyway, according to Kant. But then we have the negative part. And the negative part, its primary use is negative. That's what Kant admitted. 
what I just read. But he goes on to say, there also is a positive result from the negative project. And this is where he brings in the relationship to morality. Are there, oh, there is a question. Came in a long time ago. So Kant considers all knowledge to be synthetic besides imminent knowledge. Um, okay, so um, first of all, I'm glad you asked that question because it's like um, I can keep talking and talking and think I'm being clear and then obviously I wasn't being clear. <laughs> so um, So synthetic, the opposite of synthetic is analytic. And like I said, in the reading for next time, we're gonna see a lot about the difference in synthetic and analytic. So I'm not gonna to try to describe it now, but synthetic and analytic are two kinds of a priori knowledge. Analytic is, like I said, it's kind of, um, it's the kind of thing that Locke calls trifling. <laughs> it's basically like things that are true by definition. Um, so synthetic is the, like, any kind of, like, really, anything that really adds to our knowledge and takes us beyond what we already knew is, is going to involve synthetic um judgments according to Kant so in a in a sense all all knowledge properly speaking is synthetic I don't want to like uh, isn't, isn't synthetic though based off of experience no so a priori means it's not based off of experience right that's the only that's where I'm confused yeah so the the opposite of a priori is a posteriori. Yeah, a posteriori, which means from after, right? <laughs> and um, uh, right. And an an example of a posteriori knowledge is something like all bodies are heavy. That's Kant's example. It's basically the law of universal gravitation, right? Every body attracts every other body, every other body. Um, so it works again. Um, so Empiricists, a strict empiricist would say all our knowledge is a posteriori, or that is at least all synthetic knowledge is a posteriori, right? So Hume agrees that we can know this kind of thing without experience. This is what Hume calls relations of ideas. Um, but again, this doesn't really have this is pulling out of our concepts what we already put into them. So it's, and it's, it's not adding, it's adding maybe clarity, but it's not adding substantial new ground to our knowledge, right? So all synthetic knowledge, a strict empiricist would say, all has to be a posteriori. Whereas, of course, a strict rationalist says all our knowledge is a priori. Kant thinks the rationalists were particularly not careful about making this distinction. 
Um, okay, well, I, I'm not going to say more about that now. But um, so whereas Kant's answer is, um, yes, we have this. We have synthetic a posteriori, a posteriori knowledge, right? So like Leibniz, who says, we could never learn from experience that all bodies are heavy. And therefore, it's absurd that, to say that all bodies are heavy. And that's his point against Newton. <laughs> Right? Leibniz denies the law of universal gravitation. So, um, right, you know that gravitas means weight, right? So the, the, the law of universal gravitation is the law of universal heaviness. Right? So Leibniz denies that all bodies are heavy. Um, precisely because if it were true, it could only be known a posteriori, and he thinks that's impossible. <laughs> but uh, so, but Kant is saying, yes, if we have this kind of knowledge, of course, but the empiricists are wrong. We also have this kind of knowledge, synthetic a priori knowledge. So there's some things we can know that we didn't learn from experience, but they're not just true by definition. Um, and an example of that is supposed to be, well, examples of that, again, are supposed to be there exists a unique straight line between any two points, or every event has a cause. Um, and so getting back to the question you asked in the chat, so Kant considers all knowledge to be synthetic besides imminent knowledge. I think what you mean is something like, or that is the way you should say this is, Kant considers all synthetic knowledge to be a posteriori besides imminent a priori knowledge or something like that. Does that, is it clear why I'm rephrasing it that way? Well, I just understand imminent as being uh, before a, a priori. And so how I just, I was thinking that synthetic would not, it would have to consist of experience. Um, otherwise, if you didn't, you, you didn't have the experience, um, you couldn't create something from nothing. Well, so, okay, I, I think maybe now I see what you're getting at. So, um, um, a priori knowledge doesn't mean innate knowledge, according to Kant. Like I said, a priori is not really a special time that's like really, really early, like really far before all my experience or something like that. In fact, Kant is going to begin the, this is the beginning of the introduction, the beginning of the aesthetic. I don't remember. Anyway, by saying, um, all our knowledge begins with experience. Um, so, uh, um, it's true that we couldn't even think every event has a cause until we've already experienced events. Um, nevertheless, we don't learn the principle from that experience, and we couldn't, as Hume shows, right? No amount of experience of events could ever teach us that principle. Okay, I'm tracking now. That okay. filled a gap. <laughs> okay, good. Now, all right. Okay, so someone yeah. asked me in a direct message, this might be a dumb question, but what does a concept mean here? That is so far from being a dumb question that um, I've avoided talking about it in this lecture because it would have taken up the whole lecture. <laughs> but I am gonna, so I am gonna talk about it a lot next time, but I'll just say, 
Um, and this is, I guess, not coincidentally, the same, the very same distinction I'm going to have to explain right after this in my first lecture about Locke um, in 100C, that um, uh, so what Kant calls a judgment, what other people sometimes call a, what Locke calls a proposition, um, has this form in general, or at least this is the simplest form of it. And this is a way of thinking about, and, and all our knowledge is built out of these kind of judgments or propositions, right? This is the kind of thing you can know. Right, so an example would be something like, well, like all bodies are heavy. So when all bodies are heavy, S is body and P is heavy. S stands for subject and P stands for predicate, right? Um, that's an example of a universal judgment. Um, there also can be particular or singular judgments, but let's stick with that one. That's, that's the easiest to understand for now, right? So all bodies are heavy or body is heavy, <laughs> right? Um, the concepts are these things. Right, so a concept is in like, when you express the judgment in language, the, the judgment is gonna be expressed as a complete sentence and the concepts that make it up are gonna be expressed typically as noun phrases or adjectives, although it could also be a verb or whatever, but think of it that way to begin with, right? So like body and which is a noun and heavy, which is an adjective and to make a judgment, you put them together using this little word is, <laughs> as Scott says, um, um, and, and thereby you say something about something. And what I was saying when I said that Kant doesn't question our right to the principles, but Kant questions our right to the concepts which the principles are made up of. Right, so um, um, like if you say something like God is absolutely simple, rather than asking what gives you a right to say that God is absolutely simple, Kant is going to ask what gives you a right to deploy the concept God here? Right, that would be the subject. Did, <laughs> um, uh, right, bachelor is an unmarried man. Um, well, okay, but first, it, did that answer the supposedly dumb question, which is not dumb at all, and I'm going to talk about it more, uh, a lot more about what Kant means by concept soon, but does that answer the basic question about what's meant by here? Does the concept include the rules that apply to it? The concept, that's an even less dumb question. <laughs> um, the concept involved, knowing the concept involves some kind of, knowing some kind of rule. As I understand it, it involves knowing the rule that is the concept, that its objects have to conform to. But I know that um, it's possible to read Kant a different way and to think that knowing the concept is knowing the rules that the concept, that apply to the concept. Uh, anyway, that's not the way I'm going to understand it. I don't know if I understood that question correctly and answered. So like the concept body includes, and. Well, I'll talk more about this a lot next time and then after that, but 
in a preliminary way, you can think of the concept as including, as, as being like, first of all, you can think of it as roughly being like what Locke calls an idea. Um, and you could think of it as involving a list of properties that something has to have in order to fall under that concept. So in the case of body, like if a body is a solid extended substance or something like that, then, you know, the concept body would involve substance, extension, and solidity. And the rule is, the rule would be whatever's going to count as a body has to have those characteristics. Okay, and someone else was asking about, and yeah, they meant to say, is a bachelor an unmarried man? That's often given as example of an analytic judgment. I, um, I've wondered through the years who who was it and when in what context who first introduced that example. I think that might be really important to know, but I don't know the answer. But it's it's Kant doesn't use that type of example. Kant's usual example of an analytic judgment is all bodies are extended. Why is that different from all bachelors are unmarried? Um, bachelor is not an empirical concept at all. It's in a sense not a theoretical concept. Right? It's it's a moral concept. It has to do with certain obligations existing or not existing. Um, so it's confusing to introduce it here. Um, um, also, is this the same thing? According to Locke, these two are closely related. I'm not sure Kant would agree, though. That it's socially constructed, as they say, <laughs> right? That is, um, in a pretty strict sense, it's a feature of our society that there are such people as bachelors. In fact, it may not may no longer really be a feature of our society. I'm not sure. <laughs> it was a feature of our society that bachelor was an important category of people. <laughs> um, so. Uh, it's an artificial concept. Um, it's not a concept. It's not that we experienced all the things that were out in the world and found that some of them, like, had found certain characteristics going together over and over, or something like that, and developed a name, Bachelor, to name those things, right? And rather, it's so to speak, although, of course, this isn't exactly right either, as if we all sat down together and decided there was going to be a certain kind of thing and attached the name Bachelor to it. OK, I, I'm not even I'm not sure what why someone was asking that, though. so maybe I said too much or too little. Okay, so one further question. If a concept is a list of properties, then are those properties true of the concept by definition? So how can we ever have a statement that is synthetic if everything can be stated by definition? Well, um, so if you think of the example, all bodies are heavy. Now, assume that heavy does is not part of the definition of body. Um, I mean, so Kant is actually going to say that empirical concepts in general don't have a definition. Um, he says that in the doctrine of the method, which is the part of the book that we're not going to get to, which is one reason when I said that analytic judgments are true by definition, I said, I qualified it. I said something like, it's kind of like they're true by definition. 
right? Um, Cop actually thinks that definitions are, at least in theoretical, the theoretical sphere, defi definitions are only useful in mathematics. Um, but yeah, so anyway, it's whatever is contained in the concept can be predicated of it in an analytic judgment. So like, and if any empirical concept does have a definition according to Kant, I would say it's probably the concept of body or matter, um, the movable in space, right? So, um, um, so like if that definition is, you know, something like extended substance um, that, that occupies space or something like that, um, then attraction to other bodies is not included in it. So how is it possible to nevertheless predicate something else of it that's not true of it by definition? So again, Leibniz says it's impossible. <laughs> um, uh, but, and therefore has to deny that all bodies are heavy could be true. Um, but Kant wants to explain why it could be true and is true as far as we know, as far as we can tell, that all bodies are heavy. Um, and the answer is supposed to be that we know by experience. So, I mean, I'll say more about that next time, but it's right. So the thought is that even though heavy is not contained in the definition of the concept, or is not part of the rule that something has to fulfill in order to count as the object of that concept. Nevertheless, we can take something that does count as the object of the, that concept. And because we experience it, we can know other things about it besides just that it conforms to that concept. And that's the basis of the possibility of synthetic a posteriori knowledge. That still leaves it mysterious how there could be synthetic a priori knowledge, and it is mysterious. That's why Kant had to write this whole big book to try to answer it. All right, I, I hope that was helpful. Okay. Um, all right, I'm glad there finally were questions. Um, that does mean that uh, I don't have time to go into in detail what I was starting to get to, namely the part at the, at the what I what I think is the key moral of the preface, namely, as Kant puts it, I had to destroy knowledge to make room for faith, um, meaning that um, I guess I'll have to talk about this a little bit at the beginning next time, but um, meaning that. Um, so for Kant, religion basically equals ethics. Um, that is the, the basis of religion is the moral law and anything else, you know, in that area are things that are necessary pre presuppositions of morality. So, I mean, that won't be the topic of this course. That's Kant's moral philosophy. Um, but, um, but what we are doing in this course, once again, is um, limiting metaphysics, saying that you have no right to talk about certain things. So as long as we adopt a theoretical standpoint, meaning we're concerned to try to find out what's true and what's false. We're looking for knowledge about things. We have to admit that we reach a limit and we can't get into this. But Kant argues somewhat in part, the argument is essentially already in this book, although most of it is in parts we're not going to get to. But, um, and then at greater length argues later that when you switch to a practical standpoint and you start asking not what is true, but what should I do? Then you find that um, from that point of view, you gain a right to, to certain concepts that you didn't have from the theoretical standpoint. 
And you're enabled to say things like God exists, there is free will, there is immortality, um, in some sense of immortality, which is a little unclear. Um, so, uh, and Kant says, but if metaphysics were able to extend itself to those questions, then um, ethics wouldn't be able to dispute it. Right, that is, if, if metaphysics could show that it was that it was absurd that there's such a thing as free will, then we would just have to admit that one of the presuppositions of ethics can't be fulfilled, and therefore ethics is impossible. But by limiting metaphysics and saying from the theoretical point of view we can't say anything about this question, we enable ethics to step in and say, well, I know what to say here. This is what you ought to believe because you must believe it in order to do your duty. All right, uh, that's all I have time for. Um, I, as I think I said at the beginning, I'm I'm hoping that I'll be back in Santa Cruz in person next week. I will let you know as soon as I know the answer to that. Um, um, so, and one way or another, I'll see you then. Okay, bye.